so let me start off with a little bit of uh, bhashan, as you say, on what is happening in the uh, database community in the last few years. So, back in the 60s, databases were a preserve of large enterprises. You know, if you were a multinational company, you would have a database. If you were a small uh, shop, you wouldn't, certainly, because you needed a very expensive mainframe. Then there was a democratization of this whole thing, which meant there was a lot of focus on small databases. Uh, small databases, which you could run on, uh, you know, if you had a shop, you could keep your inventory in a database. And there were a number of PC products, which built these small databases. That was going on. Meanwhile, for large companies, they increased the number of uh, people using the databases. Everybody who was in the company became a user, more or less, over time. And the load that uh, these large companies had to handle kept growing. The next uh, trend in database. So, this load, by the way, was something that mainframes of that era could handle. Uh, with the Moore's law, CPU speeds kept increasing, memory sizes kept increasing. And as a result, a single uh, machine could handle the needs of many enterprises. Of course, it need not be a single core. They ended up with multiple CPUs, multiple disks. But one installation with a few machines could handle the needs. Now, this state went along. And at one point, people said, uh, if we can reach 1,000 transactions per minute of a particular benchmark, TPC, then pretty much everybody's needs are met. And 1,000 transactions a second, oh, that was almost unimaginable. Who would need 1,000 transactions a second? Well, along came uh, some really big retail chains. Uh, one of the drivers of uh, some of this was a company called Walmart in the US, which opened hundreds and hundreds of shops. Each shop had dozens of people uh, checking out items. So, each second, there were items being checked out across all of this place. And what Walmart did was they pioneered the collection of every single piece of data about what was sold, what item was sold, what time, even down to the customer. If, if they knew who was the customer, they would record which customer bought it. And they collected all this data. Other companies could have, they did not. What Walmart did was they pioneered the collecting all of this data and putting it in a central data warehouse. Remember, this was in an era before the web really exploded. So, they had already started doing all this and they would get it together in a data warehouse, which uh, collected this every night, they would upload all the previous days uh, uh, information about who bought what. And one of the key things that they did was they analyzed this data. What did they do with this analysis? They could see what products were selling, what products were not selling. They could keep their inventory really tight. Most shops would buy enough material to last them a few months. Walmart could tell our supplier, their suppliers, look, uh, we sold uh, 40 boxes of this yesterday. Uh, tomorrow, suppliers 40 more boxes to replace those 40. Or maybe they would say sell us 60 boxes because the trend is going up. So, they could do all kinds of analysis on this data and manage their inventory very, very effectively. And for a retail operation, managing the inventory is a very important part. And even for manufacturers. In fact, they started giving manufacturers uh, access to their uh, data analysis systems. So, manufacturers could see what products were selling where. So, as a result, uh, if you had a company, uh, let us say Hindustan Liver, they could uh, decide uh, what to produce in the next week, based on what all has been selling in Walmart in the last few days. So, that helped the manufacturers. And this actually is set about a very uh, virtuous cycle, where uh, there was a lot of efficiency brought into production because of this. And there was tremendous value. There was also tremendous scale. Walmart managed to create the largest databases in the world at that period. Their databases were of the order of terabytes of data. Back when disks were hardly, uh, you know, 10 gigabyte disk was considered very big. One gigabyte disk was normal. They had databases with a few terabytes of data, hundreds of machines, each with many disks. So, they bought these systems from a company called Teradata, which was a pioneer of parallel database systems. So, Teradata basically is a company which is doing very well today. Uh, they are still uh, the leaders in the parallel databases for data analysis. 
and Walmart was one of their driving forces. Now, over time, other companies realized that such analysis was very important. And today, the number of companies with such large volumes of data has exploded. Now, if you went back 20 years, you would say, okay, there is Walmart with so much data. Who else has data? You know, maybe one or two other companies. Why do we care? Today, if I ask you to name companies which have this kind of scale in terms of number of shops, number of uh, things being bought in the shops. Right here in India, we have a fantastic example, um, Big Bazaar and the other shops in the future Bazaar chain. They are probably as big as Walmart is in the US. And in addition, there is this other enormous thing which is telecom. The, uh, every uh, second person in India has a mobile phone now, hundreds of millions of phones which are active. Telecom companies which are processing calls. One of the major factors for telecom companies is that people switch. They uh, go with uh, one company now and they find somebody else is giving a better rate, they go with that company. In fact, there is a new trend if you have been observing the ads of having dual SIM phones. And the simple reason is people do not want to abandon their old phone number, but they want outgoing calls on this cheaper thing. So, they can have two SIM cards. So, it is important for companies to stay competitive, to do what it takes to keep their customers. And a major factor in this is to analyze customer data. Now, the Indian telecom companies are doing it these days, but in the US, uh, long distance company, you know, phone call companies had these problems uh, about 15 years, 20 years ago, the same problem. And they pioneered a lot of work in analyzing their data and figuring out how to keep customers. So, the bottom line is that there are now many, many different industries where the amounts of data are very large and you need to analyze huge volumes of data. So, parallel databases have become a very important factor. Now, it is not just parallel databases uh, of regular traditional data. Now, there is this whole slew of uh, web facing companies where the amount of data which they get makes Walmart looks like peanuts. You know, they collect terabytes, not overall, their database is not terabytes. Their databases are many petabytes, thousands of times what Walmart was and is. That scale is, you know, something which was unimaginable some time ago for operational data. People had this kind of scale for image data. If you take uh, all these satellites that are sending images, mm, some institutions like NASA collect that kind of data and they store it, but they are not doing uh, processing on this on the fly. So, this is very different. The scale is enormous. So, a major challenge is how to deal with data at this scale. So, today I am going to cover two aspects of this. The first aspect is assuming the data has been acquired and is now stored in some kind of uh, storage system files or whatever, how do you process this data to do analysis of various kinds? in parallel. One part of the answer was to have parallel database systems and they run SQL. You just run SQL, they will parallelize it and do what it takes. And in fact, there are many companies which provide this today. Uh, as an example, I mentioned Teradata. Let me put down a few names. Okay, so, there are uh, these companies. I mentioned Teradata. Then there is Green Plum and Aster which was the company I had mentioned as being founded by an alumnus of here. And these things, as I said, uh, used PostgreSQL as the underlying database. So, what they do is they have hundreds of machines and uh, each machine is running a copy of PostgreSQL. And whatever data is there is partitioned among all the machines. And whenever you submit a query, the query itself is broken up, executed on the different machines. Then there is some amount of work to exchange data between the machines uh, as required to complete the query processing, little more work in PostgreSQL and lo and behold, your answer is there. In fact, what is interesting is uh, there was a project called Affordable, I do not know if you can read this, Affordable Databases, uh, Affordable Parallel Databases I should say, uh, which uh, Professor Fartak was carrying out a few years ago. And interestingly, in parallel with these companies, he also had uh, architecture where 
there were a number of inst copies of PostgreSQL on separate machines, and then a layer on top which could parallelize queries amongst these. Of course, this particular project was never commercial, it was a research project, uh, but the others do have commercial offerings which are quite well known and popular on the market today. So, this is one whole class of uh, companies uh, which handle uh, very large query processing. But these were all SQL. Now, about uh, again 15, uh, 10 years at least back, companies such as uh, web companies such as Google, Google was a pioneer in this. What they realize is that they are getting a huge amount of data which they need to process in some way. Now, most of this data was not traditional database data. Amongst the kinds of data they had to process were uh, collecting uh, web pages which they crawl from across the world and then building an index on it. That is one example. Another example is um, they have all these uh, logs of what people are querying and they want to analyze those logs to, you know, maybe to uh, look at um, what answers Google has been giving, giving and to check who clicked where on what answers, uh, is Google, uh, you know, giving the uh, good answers at the beginning or is its quality going down by giving answers at the beginning which nobody is clicking. So, what they now have is huge amounts of click data, what people clicked on. So, what people searched, query logs and in the query result, what did people click on, click logs. So, they have uh, hundreds of millions of uh, such queries and clicks every day and they want to analyze those to see what is happening. So, there is a lot of analysis on data which is not traditional uh, relational uh, database data which has to be parallelized. As you can imagine, there is no way to analyze this click data on a single machine. There is no way you can build a keyword index on billions of documents on a single machine. All of this has to be parallelized. That much is obvious. What is not obvious is how much parallelism do you need to handle such jobs? And the answer it turned out was not tens of machines. Tens of machines was what Teradata, you know, was it was a piece of cake for Teradata. Hundreds of machines, that was, uh, you know, the upper end of Teradata's installation some years ago. Uh, today, they are probably much larger, but uh, the largest installation 15 years back was probably several hundred machines. Now, companies like Google realized that several hundred machines were not going to cut it. What they needed was thousands, in some cases tens of thousands of machines to analyze the amount of data that they have. They really have to parallelize a task across thousands of machines. Now, this was a complete new ball game. One of the important things which you realize, you know, if you have one machine, it is up most of the time. If you have 10 machines working in parallel, well, they are probably going to be up most of the time too. If you have a lab with 100 machines, probably one or two of them are going to be dead. If you have a rack with 100 machines, probably one or two of them will die every uh, few months. But when you go to thousands of machines, at any point in time, surely some of those machines are dead. So, you can never actually run a computation across all those thousands of machines. You, you cannot assume that all the machines are alive. Worse still, while you are running your computations, one of those machines may die under you. It does happen. Uh, or even if it does not die, it may have uh, some problems with its disk, which means it is still working, but it is much slower than the others. So, here was a computation which finished in 2 minutes on all the other machines and one particular machine is uh, chugging along after 5 minutes, it is still not finished, it is part of the job and it is holding up all the others. So, the moral of this story is when you get to such large scale, you have to deal with failures, you have to deal with recovering uh, automatically from the failures in the sense that if something was supposed to be done by a failed node, it should be done by somebody else or if the node is slow, somebody else should take it up to finish up uh, in case this guy does not finish it in time. So, there is a whole lot of fault tolerance which needs to be built in. So, when you build applications at the scale, fault tolerance becomes very, very important. In fact, companies like Teradata knew about this and they did in fact solve the problem. Their uh, SQL engines could continue working even if a machine died 
how do you do a parallel computation if a machine dies? Well, first of all, if you have many parallel machines, the data is split amongst all these machines. This is called shared nothing parallelism. Okay? So, what this means is you have many machines all interconnected, each machine has one or more disks internally and it stores the data. So, what do you do if a machine fails? You cannot access its data, it is gone. Therefore, one key part is replication. So, what this means is whatever data is here has to be, you have to keep a copy at one or more machines or one or more of the other machines. In fact, there are some very clever tricks here. Now, one simple way is to do something like RAID 1, uh, where you just keep a copy of the same data on another machine. So, you pair up machines and keep a copy of the data on every pair. So, that if one goes down, the other has all the data. It turns out that simply doing replication in this fashion uh, causes a problem when one of the machine fails. So, think what if this machine failed? Its data is there on the pad machine. So, the data is not lost. So, now you can actually do whatever computation this machine was supposed to do, this is dead. So, whatever computation it was supposed to do, this next guy is doing. However, the next guy was not sitting idle, you cannot afford to keep half your computers idle, it was already doing some work. Now, you have a situation where you have a hundred people doing work, when one guy dies, his partner is now responsible for doing both their work what is going to happen? It should be very obvious that that partner is going to be overloaded. He is doing the work of two people. He cannot keep up with the workload. So, instead one of the key uh, things which is done is, you think of this machine's data as being split into 10 small parts. Okay. Now, the first part is replicated here, the second part is replicated at the next machine, the third part at the next one and so on. So, what you have done is you are doing replication, but you have partitioned the data at each machine into small pieces and the replicas for each piece of data are on a different machine. So, now if this guy dies, guess what? Each of these other 10 people have uh, one tenth extra work. So, whatever work they would have finished in say 10 minutes, now they will take 11 minutes to finish, which is not so bad. It is not as bad as 9 of eight of them finishing in 10 minutes and that one guy whose partner died taking 20 minutes to do it. So, it is a lot cleaner this way. So, replication is a key uh, property which any parallel databases uses uh, in order to spread the load around when things fail. Okay. Then the next question is, how do you even parallelize a query? If you, if I give you an SQL query, how do you run it in parallel? It turns out, uh, the answer is, first of all, you have to partition the data itself. How do you partition the data? There are many ways of doing it. Uh, Let us take a very simple way. We just take one tenth of the tuples in each, in the, if, if, you, if I take a particular relation R, I will take one tenth of the tuples of R, put them in machine 1, one tenth in machine 2, arbitrarily, in any old way. I do not care how I put it. I just put those tuples. Now, supposing I get a query. Uh, which says, find how many tuples there are in this relation. How would you answer this query? The tuples are broken up amongst 10 relations, uh, 10 machines. Each machine can locally count how many tuples there are. It gets the count and then sends it to the central uh, query uh, site, which then adds up the 10 counts to get the final count. So, what you have done is, you have effectively run this whole counting process completely in parallel. So, that is one of the key tricks which parallel databases use. It is not always possible to get this fantastic degree of parallelism, but in many cases you do. So, each machine works independently on its part of the data. So, this is called independent, meaning first of all, before any query processing is done, right at the beginning when you load the data, the data is partitioned amongst the machines in some way. There are good ways and bad ways, let us not bother about how to do it, it has been done somehow. Now, when you get a query, a simple count query, it was very easy to parallelize. Now, let us go one step above. Supposing the query was not just a simple count, but it was a select uh, something like, uh, 
let us say uh, shop id comma count star or could be sum for that matter from sales. Okay. This was the query group by shop id. So, what do we have here? Oh, what happened? I should look at the screen when I am writing. I am sorry, this <laughs> if you are wondering why I am doing this, uh, there is a blank sheet of paper. I take out that sheet of paper, <laughs> the whiteboard does not get erased. The paper is erased because I have a new one. The whiteboard still has old stuff. Uh, so, today I am writing everything twice. Uh, I have to again write this twice. So, let me erase the whiteboard. Uh, I cannot actually see the whiteboard when I am writing. I could, but I end up seeing the paper. Okay. Okay. So, what I was saying was this is called independent and the query I had in mind was select shop id count star from sales group by. So, the question is how will you parallelize this query? If I did not have the group by, parallelizing it was very easy. All I did was uh, each machine locally computed the count, sent it to a common machine and it just added up the counts. Now, with the group by guess what you need to do? It is actually not that hard. With a group by what you do is each machine is going to uh, run exactly the same query on whatever records it has locally. So, what its result is going to be is not a single count, it is actually a set of shop id count values. So, maybe uh, it each machine, the first machine might give something like shop id 1 count 5, this is at machine 1, shop id 2 count 10. At the same time, the next machine may give shop id 1 count 3, shop id 2 count 1 and so forth. So, now you have these relations which you have got from each of the machines. How big are these relations at each machine? They are probably a lot, lot smaller than the original data. How many shops do you have? Even a big chain like Walmart has only thousands of shops, whereas the amount of data that is in there is probably millions of records. Sales each day, there are million, each shop has uh, thousands or tens of thousands of units sold. So, the amount of data which you get as a result of executing this group by query locally at each machine is much smaller than the original data. Now, the trick is that you know in a simple setup, the results of each of these machines can be collected at one machine, which then um, runs a local sum query. So, it is going to again group by shop id. So, these two groups uh, with shop id 1 will form one group and this time instead of counting it is summing. So, it adds 5 plus 3 and gets 8. So, if there were just two uh, machines in this parallel setup, uh, we just have to add up these two and you get 8. What if you have 100 machines in this parallel setup, each of which with 1000 shops? So, now you have 100,000 uh, records, which you have to again group by an aggregate. At this scale, it may actually make sense to do this second level of grouping and aggregation in parallel itself. So, I hope you understood the problem. First of all, each machine has locally done the group by and aggregate on whatever data it has. After this, one option is you send all of this to a central machine, which again does a group by aggregate. The other option is you actually divide up these records across those machines, such that all the records for a particular group, let us say all the records for shop id 1, maybe not just 1 a few other shop IDs. Uh, so, let us say that we take all shop IDs in the range 1 to 10, go to machine 1, 11 through 21 go to machine 2 and so forth. So, what we have done is we have divided up shop IDs amongst machines. So, what happens is each machine has computed a local table of shop ID count uh, pairs and now it is going to distribute these tuples to the respective machine. So, it will say okay, my first record is for shop id 1, I will send it to machine 1. The second one is also for shop id 1, I will send it to machine 1 again. And then here is one with shop id 11, uh, which it is going to send to machine 2. And here is one with shop id 123, which it, which it may send to machine uh, 
12 or 13 in this case. Okay. So, the idea is each machine is going to get a part of this. Now, machine 1 can do a group by and sum locally on whatever it gets. And what does it give finally? It gives for each shop ID for 1, it gets a final count, let us say that is 8, for 2, the final count. So, this one machine has done all the computation required for its range of shop ID. So, shop ID 1 to 10, machine 1 has done its computation and it is finished. Similarly, for shop ID 11 through 20, machine 2 will do its job and it is finished. What have we just done? This job of the second level of aggregation, we have actually parallelized across all the machines which are in our cluster and each of them is again doing a part of the work. At the end, each has finished its work, locally it has got all the data. So, the final result is now stored locally in each of these machines and the only remaining job is to gather all the local results and output it to the person who submitted the query in the first place. So, what I have just shown you is aggregation can be parallelized very, very easily. It is a very natural thing to parallelize. What about other operations in SQL, joins and so on? In fact, you can parallelize joins and in fact, we have seen how to parallelize joins, although I did not tell you that was parallelism. Just think, what did we do when we did hash join? We partitioned the data and then we joined each partition. So, if you want to parallelize joins, a very natural thing is to break up the data. Now, it turns out that the data is not initially at one machine. The data itself is already partitioned somehow. So, here is the data partitioned across. Okay. So, here is the data across many machines. It is already partitioned somehow, but it may not be partitioned on the join attribute. So, what we do is we apply hash join, but we are uh, only going to do the partitioning step of hash join initially. What does the partitioning step of hash join do? It computes a hash function on the join attribute and partitions it. So, this is one relation R. Similarly, we have to do something for S, we will uh, it is the same thing. So, we will postpone that. So, what we do for R, so here are the hash partitions. So, when R goes, uh, when each of these machines, this is machine 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. So, what machine 1 so the, uh, it does is it hashes its tuples and sends it to the right place. So, now these hash partitions are again going to be on machines. So, machine 1 will correspond to the first hash bucket, machine 2 to the second hash bucket and so on. So, the number of hash buckets you create is equal to the number of machines. So, this data is going to get partitioned and it is going to receive tuples which hash to the value 1 from each of these machines. So, each machine is going through its tuples, computing the hash value and then sending it uh, whatever uh, has hash value 1 to machine 1, which is which will collect the in its hash partition. Similarly, those with hash value 2 go to machine 2 and so forth. So, what have we achieved at the end? We have What we have achieved is we have repartitioned on join attribute. So, that is the goal of this phase. So, what we have done is we have repartitioned one relation R on the join attribute. Well, now we do the same thing with S. We S is also stored on the same set of machines. We repartition S on the join attribute. And what do we have now? After we repartition S, so this is H1 h 2 and so on, h n. Similarly, s 1, s 2 and so on up to s uh, sorry uh, r 1 not h 1, r 1, r 1, r 2 up to r n and on this side you have s 1, s 2 up to s n and at this point the joins can be done locally. Each machine has all the tuples which it needs to complete the join locally on whatever it has. What, I, what do I mean? The ith machine here has hash partition i of r and hash partition i of s. All we need to do now is join the corresponding hash partitions of r and s. So, each machine locally does the join of whatever h i uh, sorry r i and s i it has does the join 
and outputs the results locally. So, what have we just done? We have just taken the join operation and shown how to parallelize it across machines. There is a cost. This thing here, all these lines here, uh, which you see going from uh, here to here, these are all edges which are actually network traffic. Tuples are going across the network to repartition the relation. This is actually fairly expensive. So, nothing is free, but if your network is fast enough, this will work reasonably fast and then you do the joining locally and you are done. So, what I have just shown you is it is actually quite easy to partition uh, and parallelize the join operation. So, the moral of the story is uh, you can continue with other operations, even sort and so on can be parallelized. So, the moral is that you can take an SQL query, take the standard relational algebra operations we have seen so far and parallelize them very effectively, whether it is join, selection, group by, uh, sort, whatever, we can parallelize all of them. As a result, parallel databases succeeded in many applications where other parallel uh, things back in the nineties, uh, eighties and nineties before the web era. The people built a lot of parallel computers and they were used for two tasks. One was for scientific computation like weather prediction or simulating nuclear bombs or whatever. And the other was for business applications which had to uh, store and analyze large volumes of data and parallel databases did very well in that market. Okay, so, now fast forward uh, to the current uh, era of uh, web scale computing and it turned out that they needed to parallel process, but they had a lot of jobs. Now, SQL is a language which was designed for doing, uh, you know, storing and processing data in ways in which typical uh, applications uh, or commercial requirements uh, needed. And that made complete sense to parallelize access to data. You have a declarative language for querying data. The declarative language was invented not for parallelism, but to make the programmer's job easy. But a fantastic side effect it had was that you can parallelize SQL queries very, very easily. Think about it. If instead of having SQL, the same thing had been written in C code, it is notoriously difficult to parallelize C code. But simply by using a declarative language, life was much easier and it was parallelized. So, that is where the world was pre-web. But when the web era dawned, people realized that they have a lot of tasks, many of which could not be expressed very easily in SQL. They were much more complicated tasks, which actually need to be parallelized and processed on very large volumes of data. And the data again did not necessarily have any good fit with relational databases. As an example, um, if uh, Google has crawled the web and it has a local copy of all the web pages which it found. Now, it needs to do some analysis on this. It wants to compute page rank. If you have uh, not heard of page rank, uh, it is a way of ranking web pages by computing some uh, statistics uh, based on what web page links to what other web page, uh, which was the major reason that Google came into prominence about uh, 15 years back, when Google, uh, less than 15, it is what, 12, 13 years back I should say. It became an overnight hit because uh, they had a new way of how to rank websites or web pages, which gave much better, much more intuitive results than what other search engines of that era had. In fact, you know, if you think about it, page rank was described in one paper and it can actually be expressed in a few lines of code. But that was the major difference which catapulted Google above all other companies. That was the key thing which let them give better search results. Then of course, many other things followed. Once it was clear that they had some really cool technology which gave better results, uh, people are attracted to it, they, get, they got funding, they could do many more things. They built thousands of applications which all of us use today. But the key step initially was this page rank. Now, it turns out the page rank computation on the web scale is actually not that easy. It is very easy to give an equation for computing page rank, but how to compute it on billions of documents? Computing a matrix computation with billions and billions of entries is mind boggling. So, it turns out you obviously have to parallelize this work. So, the question was how do you parallelize this 
kind of processing across not one, but thousands of machines. Each machine has some documents uh, and you want to do some work on each of those machines. So, what Google did was it went back to an old paradigm for uh, parallel processing called MapReduce. MapReduce was introduced long ago. I think it was how, how long now? I think maybe 35, 40 years ago the concept of MapReduce was introduced in uh, the programming, parallel programming language community. And it turned out that it was a very, very nice way of expressing how to parallelize uh, certain computations, which did not ever fit at all with SQL. So, what I am going to do next in today's lecture is switch from these parallel databases, which have certainly been very successful, they are very useful. Uh, in fact, we have a chapter on it in the book uh, and uh, feel free to read it and read the slides and then read the chapter. What I gave you here on the whiteboard was a small uh, peek at what is there in the chapter. There are many more details. Incidentally, talking of whiteboard and slides, for the past nine days, I have been using a lot of slides. Uh, part of the reason for using slides is it makes it easier to cover material and it makes it easier to go through material very fast. It turns out though that uh, students do not necessarily like slides. What happens is uh, we tend to go very fast through this material. It is quite probable, in fact, I am almost sure that many of you found the pace of some of these topics extremely fast and uh, you know things zip by uh, extremely fast. Part of the reason I did this in the course is the time is limited, there are many topics I wanted to cover um, and moreover the assumption is that all of you or many of you have taught a database course already and are familiar with the fundamentals. So, I hope uh, it was uh, not too bad for most of you, but when I did the same thing with students, uh, they kind of lost it. So, of late I use uh, the whiteboard a lot more with students. I keep slides as a backup for certain things which are too tedious to write or draw on the board, but for all other things I use the whiteboard just like I did with you, drawing a few diagrams. It reduces the pace, more important it reduces the amount of material which I cover in a class, but it turns out there is a big benefit. The students actually understand the material in a lot more depth than if I put it on a slide and zip by and say here is something, hope you understood it, move on to the next slide. And guess what? They did not understand it, they did not get a chance to recover. But when I do it on the board and take some time explaining it, well they have some chance to catch up, assuming they are attentive. Of course, there is another problem which everybody has. Uh, I have heard this uh, from other faculty in IIT, I have heard this from faculty in other IITs, I have heard it from faculty in other universities across the world um, that uh, capturing the attention of students these days is very difficult, because they feel that all the information that they need, they can get from Google. They just search Google or, or whatever, Bing or Yahoo or Rediff or who, you name it. They can get it from their favorite search engine, uh, which is kind of true actually. If you just take raw information, yes, they can get it. But the point of teaching a course like this is to curate that information, to decide what of that enormous amount of information makes sense and to teach it in a proper flow, so that from one topic to the next, you have the background and can understand the next topic and so on. So, our job as teachers is to organize this flow and to have examples and uh, help students learn it. So, you know some of you probably only use blackboards, to you this is you know there is no point saying this, you are already doing the right thing. For those of you who like me use slides and we do make slides available for the book, they are very useful. Uh, it is quite nice to back off from slides and use the whiteboard wherever possible. 